And it's really great to be here with um, you, Kate, and Janet, and I've just met Katie Ray as well. Uh, so Jim, my time at the Bureau goes back, goes back before my graduate days. I was an undergraduate RA for David Bloom. So I wrote my undergraduate thesis on a wait for it, a CPT. So many of you who may not know what that is, it's a dedicated gigantic word processor um, <laughs> at, with the most gigantic floppy drive. And um, you know, I, was, I attended some of the bureau sessions at Quincy House uh, back in the day. And I truly owe my love of economics to the many friends and colleagues I've had at, um, at the Bureau. It is truly a special place. And you know, as you pointed out, Jim, that is really due in large part to Marty. So uh, you know, I, I learned a little bit of public finance with him. I'd see him around the Bureau. But you know, I was also a research assistant to him, just for briefly. But I'd be sitting in his office you know, listening to Martin Feldstein with his insights and his brilliance and listening to his guidance and instructions. But I'll confess that I was really distracted <laughs> by the many cartoons he had on his wall <laughs> from his time at the CEA. Now, my favorite was he was in a skiff rowing in one direction and the others were in the other direction and Reagan yelling, Feldstein! I couldn't find that one, but I found a couple of others. and. I, I, so one, I just love the humor, and I was I was distracted by that. Um, but the thing that all of these cartoons reflect, and that I so admired about Marty, was that he was willing to speak truth to power, when that power was the president of the United States. Uh, he understood that, um, you know, a, a decision maker has to be here from all sides, has to hear. Uh, they have advisors for a reason. And they need to hear what their advisors really have to tell them. And then they're going to go off and make their decisions. So I have one more slide here. And so <laughs> I, you know, I, I followed this. So I'm not going to presume to you know, match up to Marty as chair of the CEA. He really was uh, amazing in that role. But I can tell you the number of times, and my staff will tell you it was probably more times than we really would like to admit or that we should say publicly. <laughs> The number of times I would say to my staff, you do not have to write or say anything that would cause you to give back your PhD. <laughs> we have our personal integrity. You cannot say something that you do not really believe you can back up with your own understanding of economics, the theory, the empirical evidence, what it might be. Um, decision makers, especially any, de any decision that's going to reach the president's desk, is going to be complicated. And economics is going to be one of many, many factors. It will not often be not the winning factor. <laughs> uh, but we should say what we have to say and understand that the decision is going to be um, a complicated one and that we need to be effective advisors in that way. So that's the way I thought of my role at the CEA. At the CEA and I truly was, uh, took my inspiration from Marty. So, Marty was appointed as chair of the CEA during a different period. We were recovering from a period of high inflation and had just come out of a recession. So I was uh, appointed during a different crisis. So I'm going to do a little bit of a way back machine because the one thing I seem to notice that we all have is a little Monday morning quarterbacking going on here. So let's just try to think back to where we were in January of 2021, if not before, because I actually think all of this goes back from before. So the first thing I would just like to, to really point out, you know, as Jim had pointed out, we had this pandemic. And let's just think about how fast this pandemic came upon us. So there's actually a laser. So if we go back to early, you know, February 29, that's when the first death from COVID was reported. Right? We saw these are deaths, these are reported deaths, which means it's not, it was probably levels were much higher. The first vaccines were only uh, administered in mid-December. When Biden took office, which was January 20th, we had about 460,000 deaths that were recorded. So that was a very quick um, in, uh, increase in deaths. Vaccines became fully available for all adults, although we did not know uh, how quickly they would be able to get, we'd get shots in arms. This is all by way of saying is that this pandemic still had much more to tell, and we did not know what the end was going to look like. So we knew we had vaccines. They'd been the first ones administered mid-December. We didn't know how effective they were actually going to be uh, in reducing transmission. We didn't know how long immunity would last once you had immunity. 
And we didn't know how quickly we'd be able to administer them and actually get shots into arms. It turns out the distribution was a huge challenge. One of the things that the Biden administration uh, did, for example, is they started to understand if you go to barber shops in black neighborhoods, that's where you can reach a lot of people. Now, you know, that's not just your typical, if we just go to the local you know, library or the local school, we can start to administer. The, those institutions don't exist in many places. So we had to get very, the administration had to get very creative. All this is why I was saying, this is my way of saying is that there was hope that the end was in sight, but we didn't really know when that would be and what it would look like. Okay, so then if we go back to the crisis. So, um, uh, you know, the, so the federal government responded, but they were responding under a lot of uncertainty. So if you go back to, again, February of March, so remember, do we wear masks? Don't we wear masks? Remember, we were first told not to mask, then we were told that we had to mask. Do we need to wash our groceries or not? <laughs> Don't know, right? There was a lot that they just didn't know about this virus. And what did we see, the, um, so what, what we did understand pretty quickly is that we had no natural immunity, so the public health people said stay home. And stay home we did. So in March and April of 2020, about 300 million Americans were under stay at home orders. So you can see the impact that had. Flights were ground to a halt. And you can even see a year later, they still hadn't gotten fully back to where they were. And I take this just as an illustration of how we just stayed home. And then two, you know, we had essential workers who needed to go to work, but those who could remote work remotely were asked to do so. And if you look at the fraction of workers that were working primarily from home, that tripled between 2019 and 2021. And so this is even, you know, a year later, a year into the pandemic. So very quickly, we had a big response to, um, uh, to, uh, to this pandemic. So just for you know, other fun things that we saw as a result, so when you stop, interesting things happen. So gas prices dropped to the lowest they had been in real terms since the early 2000s, so less than $2 a gallon in April of 20. Remember that, those days? That would be nice. Um, gasoline prices plummeted because no one was driving. And sadly, although it was good for a moment, we had the biggest year-over-year -year drop in CO2 emissions that year to year, year over year drop was two gigatons, which is two billion metric tons, which was the largest one year drop in emissions because we were simply not moving. So none of this lasted because once we started moving again, gas prices picked up and you see the airlines came back and emissions sadly have come back as well. But for a moment in time, we were frozen, which had profound impacts um, on our, our, I would act our psychological well-being, but that's another talk and I can't give it. Uh, but uh, I really do believe that that's an interesting um, aspect as well. Um, so um, this led to some unanticipated changes in our economy. So we saw that the S&P 500 dropped precipitously, but then regained, I think, faster than many of us expected. And then a, an aspect that we will be talking about for some time <laughs> is we saw that uh, people switched from consuming services, which is the blue line or the bottom line, Hank, um, or, and consuming durables. And so the fastest switch, it's not the only switch, but it's one of the fastest shifts going from services to durables consumptions um, that we've seen, seen in the United States. So if you're wealthy, you might think like we got rid of the personal trainer, got a Peloton, right? That was kind of what we got. And since things have to be produced, and things have to be shift, shipped, and shipped long distances in some, certain cases, we had uh, the, the infamous supply chain uh, constraints. So this recession caused some fundamental differences than what we had seen in many prior recessions. So what this is a graph of is uh, the New York Federal Reserve's Global Supply Chain Pressure Index. And what it does is incorporates the global transportation costs delivery times, manufacturing supply chain components. The y-axis is standard deviations from the average value, which is set at zero. And so if it's below zero, what you have is some excess capacity. And if it's above zero, you've got constraints. So when you look at the Great Recession, you saw some volatility here. But what you saw is that there was um, some slack capacity, supply chain. And look at what happened during the pandemic, it skyrocketed. So this hasn't been measured forever, but you can see it's the highest recorded. And just to put some real world context on this, 
So the cost of shipping from China to the west coast of the United States was about 1300 shipping a container was about $1,300 in February of 2020, and that skyrocketed to $20,000 in February of 2021. So for a few months, the cost of shipping a container was 1,000% higher than it had been pre-pandemic. Other challenges, remember the used cars? I don't know, we bought a used car during that time. That was a challenge. Uh, paid a lot for that. Commercial real estate, which we are still recovering from, plummeted. So there were quite a few challenges that this presented for our economy. So in this talk, I want to take away and talk about three, and then there's a bonus lesson that I'll get to at the end. Uh, lessons that I took away from the CEA perspective uh, for economists. This is for economists. I'll have some you know, ideas for research, others for economists who want to think about policy, um, and, and for those who are also trying to understand what happened. So the first lesson is, in a crisis, policymakers can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. The second is, we could have done a lot better if we'd had better data and more infrastructure, better public sector infrastructure. And the third is that crises do provide great opportunities for learning new insights about an, econo about an economy. I'm gonna do this through the lens of the fiscal response to the pandemic, UI, which is a system in sorely need of uh, love and attention, and, um, the, and what we might be learning about labor markets in the wake of this. Okay, so the first is the fiscal response. So, um, and the lesson is in a crisis, policymakers can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. So we're gonna go, once again, I'm gonna keep going back to just how fast this all happened. So if you look back, UI claims are typically, in right even before the pandemic hit, there were about 200,000 uh, initial UI claims a week. By March of, uh, uh, by, the, by the end of March, they had skyrocketed, so this was two, so on, it was like on just March 7th, or beginning of March, it was 200,000 a week. A couple weeks later, it had skyrocketed to 2.9 million, and it reached a peak in April of uh, 6.1 million claims. That is 10 times the number of initial UI claims than at the peak of the Great Recession. Look at the speed with which that happened. So policymakers thought, oh my goodness, people are now unemployed, they still have to pay their rent, they have to pay their bills, what about the businesses, we need to support this economy. So, you know, you kind of wish that our policymakers could act this quickly <laughs> on a good day, but in a crisis on March 18th, so this was really early, they passed the Families First Act, that was 192 billion. So that was uh, COVID research, that makes sense, um, it enhanced UI, uh, health funding, right? We knew we were going to need to support our public health system. Then we had, 10 days later, the CARES Act, which was $2.2 trillion. That's the largest fiscal uh, stimulus in history. And so that did an enhanced UI. We had the PPP loans and EIDL, which I'll talk about in other components. And then subsequent to that, we had the Coronas Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act, which we all forget about, but that was December 27th of 2020 which was 900 billion, and then we had the American Rescue Plan, which was 1.9 trillion. So policymakers went big. And the question is, why the big response? So a lot that was on the minds of uh, many policymakers was one was concern about just the, you know, the short-term loss of people having uh, job loss and the sharp contraction in consumption, given that consumption is two-thirds of GDP, what that was going to do to our economy. But also, there was a lot of concern about the risk of scarring should this downturn be prolonged and it take quite some time for the labor market to recover. And what was on the minds of many people were the, la the three recessions uh, before the pandemic recession. So this is in the employment to population ratio uh, want, it's indexed to the peak from the uh, previous business cycle. And so this is, uh, the, the first is the recession that was in 1990 to March 1991. These are NBER dating recessions. Um, uh, so that took um, about uh, 32 months for there to be recovery. Then in the early 2000s, uh, that took about 46 months for a full recovery. And then we have the Great Recession, which took over six years. So the concern was there would be this big contraction, people would lose their jobs, and it would take quite some time for the labor market to recover. And in that time, we have people who are out of work, 
They're losing their identity as being workers. Their, their job skills are deteriorating. And then we also know just the impact of job loss, right? I'll refer to you, the, you know, just for references, right? The jolly volume edited by Alex Moss and Dave Carr, which has a lot of papers which reflect on this. But we know that people who lose their jobs, like their wages never fully recover, it takes a hit on their employment. If you're a young person entering the labor market, it can have a permanent impact or for quite some time an impact on your wages and employment as well. Uh, not to mention when you have job loss, uh, you know, the impact that's been even demonstrated on the children of the workers that lose their jobs. So that was a lot of the concern of policymakers, and they felt that they needed to move quickly. And there was a little, there was a lot of concern that in the Great Recession, policymakers hadn't responded largely enough. So um, in the Great Recession, we had the American Recovery Act. I often confuse the R's in these two acts. Uh, I'm not that I'm proud of that. Uh, but the American Recovery Act, which was about $2 trillion, and that was the largest, so that was the largest stimulus at the time. Uh, and, the, and you saw the, how long it took for us to recover from that recession. And so they went much bigger for a total of $4.6 trillion. Add to that, you know, so that, that was a lot to add to that, the concern about the uncertainty of the length of the crisis, a view, a cal political calculation that we wouldn't be able to go back to Congress, should it be necessary, should the pandemic, we didn't know when the pandemic was going to end, if we needed to go back, could we go back and still get stimulus, so everybody went really big. Um, and so then if you add to that, um, what the Federal Reserve was doing to keep credit flowing, because that was another lesson from the Great Recession, that credit markets matter a lot uh, for keeping the economy going. All right, so that was the impetus, and uh, that was the rationale. And so the question becomes, was it worth it? So I'm going to give you two reasons, possibly. I mean, I, this is going to be work that you all will do for quite some time, <laughs> uh, right? Possibly. One, one cost, and then uh, how we can start to think about it. So first of all, uh, I've added now the employment to population, uh, the, the labor market recovery in the pandemic downturn. And you can see it was faster than in the prior three uh, recessions. In fact, it was faster than any recession since World War II. So one, uh, you know, it was largely because the, vi the, the vaccines turned, to be much, turned out to be much more effective than we anticipated. Turns out they did a pretty good job of reducing um, uh, transmission. Omicron was a bit of a left, you know, out of the left field, and that was going to happen with a virus. But more or less, we were getting a handle on the, the economy. And two, there was this huge public sector response. The fiscal response, the monetary response, there was a lot that was supporting the economy. Uh, so um, one could argue, well, that, was, that may have helped with that. Two, if you look at our uh, real GDP, uh, <coughs> Uh, output compared to other developed countries. This is work from my uh, <coughs> colleague and now classmate, uh, Jean-Maria um, Milesi Ferretti. So this looks at, this is um, uh, looking at their pre-crisis trend for each country. So that's what that's normalized to zero. And you can see that the US, and, and this is Q3 2021, which is before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And so you can see the US is just under 2% below its pre-crisis trend, and that's doing a lot better than other developed countries. So you know, one could argue that we uh, were spared the loss of trillions of dollars that our, our, our neighbors, um, our, our peers experience that we avoided because of all of the support. But of course, uh, we do know that we got a spike in, in inflation. So you know, why did inflation spike? Again, you all will be telling us for years. Uh, but the two large um, explanations are all of that fiscal and monetary response and the supply constraints. I suspect it's a bit of both. Um, and, uh, but it's far from clear that, as it was alleged at the time, not that I'm bitter, uh, that the federal response was irresponsible or misguided. Uh, I personally think that for now, it's looking as though the benefits outweigh the cost as inflation is coming down, but we're not back down to the Fed or Reserve's target. And, um, and so this is going to be something that time will tell. Uh, but at the, so I'm not declaring victory here. Game's not over, but that's how I would assess it at the moment. Uh, but importantly, this was decision making under a lot of uncertainty. Was this perfect economic decision making? Probably not. But was it good enough? Um, well, that's going to highlight how we could have done better, which is my second lesson. So the first lesson is I personally think it was probably good enough, uh, 
but I also think we could have done a lot better if we had more uh, better data infrastructure, if we had, had um, more infrastructure in our public sector more generally. So quite frankly, right, the, if you think about the, the public sector at the start of the pandemic and still today, um, we had the federal data, if you think of the computing infrastructure, if you think of the people, it just wasn't up to the task. So like, as an example, let's look out under the hood. So under the CARES Act, we had these brand new programs which were meant to support employment on the job. The PPPP program, the Paycheck, Pro Paycheck Protection Program, which were forgivable loans to small businesses, those with fewer than 500 employees. Um, and it was meant to help them make payroll, pay their rent, et cetera. And then you have the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, the EIDL, which were low interest, uh, lo low interest long-term loans, um, which were, uh, again, meant to assist with keeping people on the payroll. These were meant to be pay paid back over time. And UI was expanded to include gig workers, part-time workers, freelancers, independent contractors, and self-employed, uh, people who are not typically covered in our unemployment insurance system. So these were designed on the fly um, because they, you know, we didn't have systems in place that would already allow us, like, um, uh, allow us to support workers on their current jobs. We didn't have, uh, so we had to invent these new programs on the fly. All right, so what, how did that go? Well, on the pro side, about 40 million people received UI benefits. About nine, uh, almost a million firms received PPP loans. Almost four million received EIDL loans. That was all to the good. However, uh, David Otter and his co-authors have estimated that they were wildly, the PPP loans, for example, were wildly inefficient. That the cost, it was at a cost of about $200,000 per job, $200,000 per job year uh, that was saved for PPP, which is about PPP, yeah, that's the right number of P's, uh, which is about twice uh, the, uh, what those workers were tip paid, typically about $100,000. And there was substantial fraud. So if you look in the UI program, so there's always some fraud in UI, but the excess uh, fraud in the UI program was about, um, uh, the, the GAO estimates between $55 billion to $200 billion. Uh, in fraud, this is just a central estimate. This is between one and 135 billion. If you look at the EIDL program, uh, the estimated fraud is about 130 billion dollars. And if you look at the PPP loans, about 63 billion dollars in fraud, which is about 10 percent of the total loans that were paid. So these were not well targeted, um, and there was a lot of fraud. Why did we get the fraud? Because we workers and those who applied were they couldn't identify, they couldn't verify identities and the credit worthiness of the borrowers. Uh, they had to move so quickly. They, couldn't, they had to forego some of the usual background checks, not that they were up to stuff anyway, um, and uh, um, other procedures. Uh, some of the computers were old, working on COBOL. They were understaffed. Uh, they were relying on workers that were not skilled. Uh, and we know that we've got a lot of data privacy issues. We've got a lot of data systems that don't talk to one another, which is also hampering the ability to understand, to, to verify identities. And if you look at the UI program, we added on $600 a week. Where did $600 come from? That was the average amount that you needed to add to get a replacement rate in UI up to 100%. Turns out that meant that most UI recipients were getting replacement rates well above 100%. So that might have been a feature rather than a bug for some people, uh, but it meant that we were being, it was not well targeted, it was not precision uh, economic policy making. In comparison to our EU neighbors, where they also had fraud, because this was all done so quickly, even their pandemic response generated some fraud. But, so for, a, a, if you look at the EU area, GDP that's somewhat comparable to the US, uh, larger population, the amount of fraud that was estimated there was on an order of magnitude less than that we had here. Um, so we were relying on a public sector that just wasn't up to the task and in which we hadn't been investing in. So to make this point even more, uh, to make it even clearer, I want to just drill down a little bit on UI. So UI was created in the 1930s in the Social Security Act. Hasn't really been much <laughs> reform since then. Despite the fact that we have got major changes in our workforce, uh, we have not been making, it, we, the way that we fund UI has not been updated. Um, and. Uh, um, the, the, the variation by states means that there's wide variation across the country in who's eligible and who's not. And so it's just not kept up to the job that it was really created for, which is 
to allow for some consumption smoothing and to help workers transition from one job to the next. So what has gone wrong? Or what went wrong during the pandemic? So one, we had a lot of state variation. So some state systems were actually you know, much, in much better shape than others. Uh, but there was huge variation at the state level. As I mentioned before, some, um, some, you know, some systems were working on COBOL. There were some states in which they, uh, workers can't uh, even apply using a portable device, which many people do. This is an, and this is in, so in 2020, the GAO estimates less than 50% of the states had modernized their systems. Um, UI is underfunded, uh, underfunded. So UI tax applies to wages below a cap. In 1937, that cap applied to about 90, 97% of all wages. Today, it's about 25%, which means that our UI system just doesn't have the revenue in order to make the kinds of investments it needs to make. So aware of these problems, tucked into the American Rescue Plan, there was $2 billion for UI modernization. DOL managed to spend about a billion of it. And then last June, when we had this little debt ceiling problem, Congress was looking for some ways to say, like, we got something for it. So they rescinded a billion dollars of it. So we still have a ways to go in making the kind of modernization, uh, just the kind of technology to keep UI up to snuff. And then, UI has not kept up with our labor markets. So we've also got a problem that we've got a decline in recipiency rates. So this is the, the fraction of, uh, you know, of unemployment, of people who are unemployed that are, uh, who are actually covered by UI. I've smoothed this with three-year moving averages just to smooth it out. So you can see back in 1950, just under 50% of workers were covered by unemployment insurance, and that that has fallen to under 30%. So who's not covered? If you quit, if you were fired for cause, if you're a student, if you're self-employed, if you're a gig worker, if you're a contract worker. Yeah, also in many states, you have to meet minimum uh, wage earnings requirements. And uh, you might have had to have some time on the job. So what happened is you can see a little bit of variability. Oh, wait, I don't mean to do that just yet. Um, so during this time, states were, there, there was challenges in the UI fi financing. So state, a lot of states tightened their eligibility. Um, and in this time, since the Great Recession, we don't fully understand that. But one explanation may be that a lot of workers just aged out or they timed out of UI. Because remember, it took a long time for the labor market to recover. And two, uh, states may have also tightened um, eligibility in order to, to preserve their financing. But three, we've also had some other changes in our labor market. So this is from a paper by Larry Katz and Alan Kruger, uh, which looks at the rise of alternative work arrangements. So they went back to 1995 and 2005, so alternative work arrangements, and these are typically not covered by UI. You have independent contractors, on-call workers, temporary help agencies, and on contract workers provided con by contract firms. This is the total. Not a huge change between 1995 and 2005, but you can see a five percentage point increase between, uh, since 19, uh, 20, between 2005 and 2015. You can see one of the big increases is workers provided by contract firms. In fact, do you, uh, that, so that's been a huge increase. So DOL has just actually issued some regulations where they're trying to tighten up the definition of who's a contract worker in order to cut down on what they call misclassification. Uh, but this is especially important because even since 2015, we've had a rise of gig work, which is just another modernization of our workforce. So this is from a wor NBER working paper uh, by Andrew Guerin and, and co-authors, which shows the rapid rise of gig work in our labor market. So there are two lines here. Uh, so the blue line with the, with the squares represents workers where there was any um, online platform economy income, so gig, gig work income. And then the red line is the, with, the, with the diamonds is um, more than $500 or $600. So before here, they sort of diverge. They, they converge here because um, in the tax forms, the gig platforms are only reporting workers that have a, a stronger attachment. But you can see this tremendous rise. Back in 2012, there was almost no gig workers that were being reported. Um, whereas if you fast forward to 2020, uh, 2021, it's about 5 million workers, about 3% of the workforce. Pew Research has some research that suggests it may be as big as 9% of the workforce. So this is 
um, a, 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 a large change in our, our labor force. For about a third of workers who are in, uh, engage in gig work, they report it as their primary income. For almost 60%, they report that it's a central component to help them meet their needs. So these workers are not covered by our UI system. This is, not the, this is not the only place that it's a challenge. They also do not necessarily get health insurance. This is known, but this is a place where our, our whole benefit system, which relies on employment, where we get our benefits through employers, has not really evolved. The Affordable Care Act is an attempt to do that on the health insurance side. And actually, John Gruber has a proposal that he put through, and I'm going to say Brookings, working paper, um, as a Brookings brief, uh, where he proposes something similar on the UI um, side. Others have proposed uh, portable benefits on UI, but we need to address this. This is a place where our UI system has not evolved to keep up with our labor market. OK. I would be remiss, just because of where I am, if I did not point out another area where we need more better investment in our public infrastructure which is in federal tax enforcement. So this is work that's been really highlighted by Natasha Saran and Larry Summers and Nate Hendren, which really illustrates the cost of not making these kinds of investments. So on the left, you have uh, the percentage of returns that are audited by the income of the recipients. And you can see a, a, a steady decline in audit rates for those making $500,000 or more, with a really steep decline since 2015. In contrast, the returns, the audit return, is more than pays for itself for these wealthy individuals. So if you look here on the right, it's the audit revenue per the, for the cost of uh, conducting the, the audit. And uh, one means that you're getting a dollar for each, you know, each dollar that it costs to conduct the audit, you get a dollar in return. But you can see for the top 1%, it well more than pays for itself. And yet that is not where we are putting our auditing dollars. So these guys were pretty influential. And in the Inflation Reduction Act, there was money set aside for the IRS. Um, and uh, GAO has just estimated that the IRS has already brought in more than a billion dollars in, re in additional revenue as a result of the investments that they've been able to make in recouping back taxes of millionaires. And they've also reduced wait times of about four minutes uh, for those who call in. So with investments, we can actually help. This is one way we can help make our federal system more efficient, but we have to be investing in the infrastructure to do so. OK, my last lesson. Crises can provide new insights about our economy. So this is, an, uh, this is a, um, a pattern which I'm just going to be quite, I, I put out there. I've, I discussed this at a, um, a talk I gave at the Boston Fed last fall as well, because I know for I, for one, was not anticipating this result. Uh, back in early uh, 2021, and that is that we've seen uh, income compression um, th through this pandemic. So just to illustrate this, uh, this is a chart from uh, Otter, Dubay, and McGrew, where they have um, divided uh, the distribution into three occupational terciles and do the, uh, doing the, the wage relative to 2020, January 2020, so that's index of 2020. And what you can see is before then, the three terciles were rather trending together. The lowest tercile was making faster gains, but they were largely trending together. But that since the pandemic, you've seen that the lowest tercile has seen real gains um, in contrast to the bottom uh, two terciles. You can see a little bit of bump up here at the end, but really, especially the top tercile uh, has seen real wage losses. I did not expect this myself. As I said, we were worried about scarring. We were worried about a weak labor market recovery and all the things. Um, but this compression was surprising to me. The Gini index, I would mimic this. It's the lowest it's been since 1993 as well. So we haven't seen this compression uh, in decades. So why might this have occurred? So I'm going to just tick through a few explanations that I think are not likely and then just leave you with some, uh, you know, some thoughts for further study that you, many of you are already doing, but that I'm intrigued by myself. The first is that, you know, is it that uh, we've seen a catch up in human capital skills for those who are the lowest skilled? And I'm just going to say that's rather unlikely, right? Human capital acquisition takes some time. At the post secondary level, we know that enrollment fell uh, at, with the onset of the pandemic, and it really hasn't recovered. If you look at younger kids, we had learning losses, so that goes in the wrong direction. What about increases in state and local minimum wages? You know, not likely. Minimums haven't increased at all in um, real terms. Many of them were indexed to inflation. 
20 states still have minimums that are indexed that are at the federal minimum wage, which hasn't changed, still at 7.5 an hour. So that means that they've lost in real terms. So the, the increases in minimum wage are unlikely to explain that increase at the bottom turnstile. Uh, what about unions? Um, uh, I think that unions, uh, this may be one we're studying for a little while. It's not union being a member of a union per se right now. So union election petitions were up in 2020, 2022. They've increased even more in 2024, and win rates have ticked up to 79%. So we know that there's a lot of interest, there's a lot of activity, but union density has continued to decline, and it's had a historic low of 20, 10% uh, in 2023. So it's not unionization per se. On the other hand, the threat effects may well be at play here, uh, and I, I personally wouldn't rule that out, but I wouldn't say it's a direct, it's a direct impact. So what might have happened? OK, so the pandemic recession only lasted two months. Employment was back to about 5% in September of 2021. We know that with all the generous pandemic support, uh, we had the Great Wall of Savings. So households had a lot of savings. They didn't have a lot of places to spend it. They were given a lot of support, which likely increased reservation wages. And at the same time, what did we do? We took a different tack than many of our peer countries which is that our way of supporting people, aside from PPP and EIDL, was largely to support people through unemployment insurance, which basically says we're gonna, you lose your job and we will support you. In contrast, in like New Zealand, France, uh, Germany, and all these other countries, they followed what, and I love this, job retention schemes, we have to call it a scheme. Um, we might call it a plan, we might call it a program, but uh, Europeans call it a scheme. So um, they followed job retention schemes. If you look at New Zealand, France, and Germany, over a third of their workforce was paid to be on their, to be retained in their employer, and they were paid through their employer even though they weren't going to work. PPP, EIDL, were somewhat designed to do that. We do have a formal system in the United States, which we call short-time compensation. It's through our UI program. Uh, it was something we tried to actually enhance in the Obama administration. Uh, it, states have to take it up and implement it. Many, uh, you know, there are a few states that have taken it up and you saw some state variation in using short-time compensation. But in the pandemic, the most you saw in the US was 5% of UI claims were through short-time compensation, which is where workers can get unemployment insurance even if they're still considered employed at a, at a worker. So we took the tack of we're gonna break up this employee employ, employer relationship and have people rematch when the labor market then uh, uh, healed and people were ready to get back to work. And as a result, we saw historically high rates of vacancy. So for like 15 months, we had 1.6 vacancies posted for every unemployed worker. And we had historically high rates of quit rates. People quit in tight labor markets. A lot of these, I think Ryan Michaels has estimated about two-thirds of the total quits, at least as measured in the CPS, this is from Jolts, uh, were employer to employer. So people quit in tight labor markets because they feel they have some confidence to do so. So both of these were evidence of a very strong work, uh, labor market where people had, again, the resources to search more intensely for maybe a better match, maybe a more productive match. Uh, but I think you know, it also reflected that they were not happy with their jobs. I have a technical term, but it's not suitable since it's being recorded. Um, so um, if you put it together, we relied on UI rather than job retention schemes. We had uh, very tight labor markets um, where workers then, and a very, you know, a lot of demand for workers. So it, it gave rise to more bargaining power for workers. Um, so is this just evidence of Oaken? So on the right is a figure from uh, a paper by Stephanie Aronson and co-authors uh, where it's an, you know, Oaken basically hypothesized that when uh, markets reach full employment that the lowest paid workers are going to gain the most as they are both drawn into the labor market, they have better labor market uh, jobs, and they can get better jobs that are vacated by those who move up. So in this figure here, um, this is full employment at zero. And so as, you, as the labor market gets tighter, you can see that the, it's red hot. <laughs> so you see that the, the gap 
between college-educated workers and non-college-educated workers narrows uh, in comparison to when you have a cold labor market. So is this just evidence of Oaken, which really can exist in a competitive labor market, um, and it's just evidence of workers having a lot of opportunity to search? Or are we learning that maybe there some, might be some labor market imperfections? And so this raises you know, the role of uh, search, as you might find in a Diamond, Mortensen, Pisarides model. We've got a range of indeterminacy in wages and workers are, are, are searching. Or what I'm even more intrigued by is uh, evidence of market power. So um, Aaron Dubé and um, uh, David Otter and, and McGrew, right, they, they, in that paper, they put together evidence that maybe this is evidence of greater monopsony. I mean, Dave Card and his uh, AEA and his, I guess, um, actually it was in the Nobel Address, right, goes through a lot of evidence on the role of monopsony. Or Anna Stansbury and Larry Summers have a paper where they argue it's not quite monopsony, but it is some evidence of worker power. But in any event, it suggests that we don't just have a perfectly competitive labor market that's at work here. So three lessons. In a crisis, we can't let the perfect be the enemy of good. We need more data and uh, public infrastructure if we do want to do better economic policymaking. We can learn lots of new things about our economy and uh, really many important questions remain. So the final lesson is that crises provide full employment for economists. So thank you. <laughs>